Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined by a member of our community today, Thea Cody of Designable Environments. Thea's joining us from just outside Toronto and I'm going to massacre Mississauga. <laughs> <laughs> that was really close. <laughs> so um, it, 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 uh, it's tricky. Um, but anyway, it's great to have you with us. Um, can you give us a little bit of uh, you know, what you're working on and how you came to um, be working in the field of accessibility? Because you're, you're a great member of our community. You're always contributing. But, but you know, let, let's hear a bit about you and how, how you came to work in the field. Well, first, can I just start by saying just how overwhelmingly thrilled I am to be on Access Chat. I look up to all, all of you, and I just so love this program, and it's such an honor to be here. Um, how did I get into accessibility? Um, well, uh, 20 years ago, I was finishing school, um, and what we have here is, I always wanted to be an architect, but I graduated from school at the end of the uh, uh, 80s, and it was in university at the beginning of the 90s. Um, and I think, as you may remember, the economy was bad then, too. <laughs> and my parents' business was struggling, so I wasn't able to stay in school. And so my dream of being an architect, you know, that, that didn't happen. Um, but I went back to school uh, in the um, late 90s, and uh, there was a program called Architectural Technology. And that was actually a really interesting fit for me because I had all my love of architecture, but... <laughs> I also had all this computer background because my parents were computer consultants and we were some of the first people in our neighborhood who had microcomputers <laughs> at home. So uh, it, the whole idea of using computers to do architecture and, and do 3D modeling and, uh, and all the rest of the tech stuff. And the role of an architectural technologist is between the architects who's trying to make the building, who's gonna do this fabulous thing, and the contractor who has to try to figure out how to build this thing that the architect's describing. Uh, and I was really lucky because the president of the company and now my um, business partner um, was uh, the program coordinator at that school. And he was actually teaching a course on universal design. Now my passion in architecture was about sustainability and green design. And I took his course because I'd literally taken every course I could take on that subject. And universal design seemed like it was an interesting one. And the very first day he had us do two things. One, we read the, one of the laws in our country, um, the Human Rights Code, which says buildings and spaces shall not discriminate against people with disabilities. And two, he had us read a story from the 70s called The Disabled Village. And uh, I don't know if you've read this story, but it's a paradigm shift where the entire village are people who are using wheelchairs. Now, my definition of disability is not just people in wheelchairs, it's all different types of disabilities, but this story was what if everybody uses wheelchairs and there's just a small percentage of the population who are able-bodied. And so the story sort of runs through how a society thinks and the bias and prejudice people can have. Um, and in this case, it was against the um, non-disabled people. Uh, and how they built their environment. If everybody's sitting down, then you wouldn't need to have eight foot ceilings and seven foot doors. You'd have a five foot door um, or maybe even shorter. And so all the able-bodied people or the non-disabled people had bruises on their foreheads from hitting their heads on the door frames. And so instead of fixing the doors and fixing the architecture, they issued people helmets and gave them body braces that held them in a crouched position. And, um, and then the, you know, people had back problems and there are all kinds of, you know, they just fixed the building and the resistance was why should we fix the building? There, how many of them are there? And it was just such a shock to see it from the other side and, and really feel like that's wrong, uh, that it transformed my world. <laughs> that was a turning point. Uh, and I was lucky enough when I graduated uh, that um, uh, my professor then offered me a position at Designable Environments. And Designable Environments is one of the coolest places to work, honestly. It's like a think tank about accessibility. It's one of Canada's oldest accessible and universal design consulting firms. It provides expertise to the public and the private sectors on creating built environments that meet the needs of all people, including persons with disabilities and the elderly. Our services are like, and that's why it's like working at a think tank. We get to see accessibility from different vantage points. We work with design input and reviews. We do facility audits. 
We do accessibility compliance reviews. We do accessibility standard developments and we do education and training activities. So it's such a neat place to work. Our team has a diversity and depth of experience, which is really unmatched in our industry here in Canada. Uh, although we have many great firms that do this work as well. But we've been lucky enough to work locally, nationally and internationally on retail, entertainment, corporate, commercial, healthcare, recreational, judicial, religious, transportation, residential, and of course, education. We want to keep people safe and places accessible. And it's really not rocket science how to do that, but it does take some planning and considers things that are not taught in most design or hospitality education. So we see possibilities because Designable Environments has been do focusing on accessibility for 30 years, that many people are just unaware of those resources or ideas. Our goal is to make or help to make it possible for as many people to be included and avoid the typical mistakes that are often cost a fortune to fix after they've been created than it would be is if they just built it right in the first place. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And I, I, I know that the, the cost of retrofitting accessibility is you know, really significant. Um, I, I've got a question, and this this is actually, I think, really interesting. You said that you were studying um, architectural technology. I think we're now in a time where technology is embedded or becoming embedded in architecture far more. You know, uh, we've got smart cities, but also sort of smart buildings. You know, it's not just sensors but actuators there's all sorts of stuff being uh, included in into the, the the fabric of what we're we're now building how do architectural technologists build accessibility into the buildings of the future well, one of the great things about working at Designable is I'm not actually working as a typical architectural technologist. I get to work exclusively as an accessibility specialist. Sure. Uh, but we're working with the design firms or with the building owners. Um, and what's interesting, is, as you said, as technology starts to sort of take hold is um, that there's an advantage sometimes to having the opportunity to see what something is going to look like before you actually build it, right? So the 3D modeling and um, the 3D uh, walkthroughs that you can take through a building, um, some of the time what we're asking people to do is try render the video from a seated position. Change, try and change the eye have a height, which is like a default set for a non-disabled or an ambulatory person. And what if it was down lower? And then more interestingly, with some of our other clients, and this is like really just brand new kind of stuff, what if you took a video render or a picture that you've done, a photorealistic picture you've tried really hard to make really accurate, and what if you blurred it out like you had vision loss so that you could really only see the light in the dark, right? Um, would, how can you navigate through some place? Because I think so often, and this is why I've been focusing so much on trying to get help to education, uh, like with the uh, course that I helped to develop with the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Um, because so many people uh, are coming into this field, going through training that just assumes everybody's non-disabled. And if you have 20 and 30 year olds who are in charge of design, then all they're gonna do is reflect what's that happening around them. So they're not really gonna understand. Uh, and that's also why I started running what we call our accessibility bootcamp to really get people to confront, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much bias I had about what people with disabilities could or should or can do or would want to do. Um, and then really try to dispel the idea that a disability is something that's gonna happen to somebody else. Like maybe it's gonna happen to your grandparents or maybe it's gonna happen to somebody that you know, but it's never gonna happen to you. And if you think about it, the, really the whole premise of how we design right now is really strange because we're all, 100% of us, if we're not born with a disability, we're an illness, accident, or aging away from getting one. So it, it's better design to design flexible, accessible, inclusive design that works for everybody over the course of their entire life. 
Um, and so technology can help us uh, do that. Sometimes technology can get into the way because architects will say, or um, building owners will say, well, if our building is confusing to navigate or our airport is confusing to navigate, we won't try to make sure we have better architecture or better design. We'll try to get some technology solution. We'll put something on a smartphone. And the problem with this type of thinking, of course, is that often non-disabled people are some of the poorest in our um, society. It's really hard to get a job, often because offices and buildings or workplaces are not accessible. So saying to somebody, here, we have a solution for you that requires you to have a smartphone with a data plan to people who are, you know, in a socioeconomic position to not be able to afford those things can be a barrier in and of itself. Yeah. So you, you've got double, uh, double exclusion. You've got digital exclusion. You've got the exclusion of inaccessibility. Antonio, I know you had a, a question. Yes, uh, uh, it's great to have you here and fin finally meet. We always like to know know the face behind the tweets, so it's it's great to have you here today. Uh, I've been, you know, um, over, I met uh, architects over the years. I have a few colleagues of mine who study ar architecture, and and there's plenty of events uh, and conventions on, on architecture. Uh, how do you see uh, them and that part of industry addressing uh, accessibility? Is something that they often talk at congresses or it's, oh, uh, we prefer to talk about good design and awards, you know, what's the story? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that. Um, we often see accessibility in conferences um, dealt with almost the same as the way it's dealt with in the design of a process. It's usually done as an afterthought or as a sideshow, <laughs> as opposed to what I was just saying about, if the human experience is a lifetime of changing needs and abilities, then of course accessibility is integral to good design. Um, and this is why um, when I did my TEDx talk uh, a year ago and I published the article, the top insider secrets to what's stopping full inclusion in the built environment, um, and how you can help fix them. Uh, there were really like almost six secrets. I mean, clearly they're not secrets, but they feel like they're secrets because nobody seems to know about them. And, and I go through sort of what those secrets were and then four things that fundamentally I think would change design if we could focus on it before we hire the architectural team. So what it needs to be done pre-design to set everything up for success. I can give you a, a story of a hotel that was built, uh, a new hotel that was built in Cork, uh, and you know there were, uh, uh, and there was a, a couple, uh, and they were able to, they were able, they were able to um, get in. Uh, the person was in a wheelchair, but then they were not able to get out uh, uh, because of the way out the door was built. And then th they had to wait for someone to come in, now take the old infrastructure of the door for the person to, oh leave, to leave the hotel. And I also know um, uh, uh, people who, who bring, who take their own gear on holidays uh, to make sure that the, the bed is at a certain size. So they know oh, I need this to, to do the adjustments because nobody's going to do them for me. So people who travel have all their own personal acts to deal with, with an accessible toilet or an accessible bed. So people end up to come up with the, with this with this kind of solutions. At the same time, I'm almost sure that when you are studying architecture, you are really uh, told about the trends, the social trends, and aging is is one of them. So it's quite impressive how they don't look more to the to the social the the, the social side of architecture and to the and to the mega trends. Absolutely, um, and I think like that's what struck me is that when I was studying so much about sustainability, we often looked at demographics. And so if you look at how many, particularly with first world countries are rapidly aging. I mean, in Canada, we have more than a thousand people a day turning 65. In the States, it's 10,000 people a day turning 65. Like if you wanted to, to like go where the market is, <laughs> you want to go towards, um, and, and you want to do sustainability, you want to be going towards age in place, generational housing, 
you want to have adaptable and flexible housing that people can move into in their 40s but still have their parents come and visit them or if their child is born with a disability still you know be able to stay in the communities that they love um, and this is i think why uh, particularly uh, i was focusing on the pre-designed solutions it's too often because we're not thinking about accessibility in something what we call in the industry functional programming and that's the stage where we figure out what all of the different room types we're going to have are and how much space is needed for each room so if you need to have a turn circle or the clear floor space to access something or a knee space or or how high can you reach in some place this is where you should be thinking about it and because it's not typically done people just use the same sort of solutions uh, in the feasibility study stage, which is also one of the pre-design stages, you're figuring out where you're going to build or where you're going to, which building you're going to pick to maybe rent space in. So this is something that you could even think about. Is the building we're moving into even accessible so we can hire staff with disabilities? Um, you have to put together a budget. You have to select your site. You're picking features so that you can make sure you can afford things later like power door operators. Uh, assistive listening systems and um, like hoists if you're going to have an adult change uh, uh, place, right? Um, and then furniture, fixture, and equipment lists. These are the things that populate our space. Like this is heartbreaking for me sometimes. I'll be working with a great architecture team um, and they build the building and we actually make it pretty accessible. And then I go visit it after it opens and the client unfortunately didn't review their furniture, fixture, and equipment lists for accessibility. And so it's been completely sabotaged. So the building itself is pretty accessible, but nothing in it. The photocopiers are not accessible. You know, the seating areas that they've carefully arranged for people are not accessible. And then there's a really powerful tool that we use for green design called accessibility or commissioning. So in green design, you commission a building at the end where you, the people who've promised that the um, heating and the air conditioning and all the um, uh, systems in the building are gonna be super efficient so that the operating costs don't cost very much. And if the commissioning shows that it's not what's been promised, then they have to fix it. So what we've been trying to do is we've been working with some of our clients adding accessibility commissioning as a part of the contract for the build. So whatever accessibility requirements have been placed as a part of the contracts, if they're not at the end, if you don't do a, a commissioning or an audit and they're not there, then somebody else has to fix it. It's not, it doesn't come back to the client to have to tear it out and fix it later. So those are, those are four really powerful things that if you're thinking about like right now, I'm thinking I might want to do something, start thinking accessibility because <laughs> that's the time to make it the most affordable and the least uh, difficult to achieve. Right, right. And Thea, uh, the thing that always confuses me is um, why aren't we designing for humans, like, um, you know, all humans? And I had um, August de la de Rintos on my show, Human Potential at Work, a few years ago, and he is a designer, a very, very talented designer. He is also an individual with a pretty significant disability. And he feels that uh, as a designer himself, an award-winning designer, he designed Xbox. He worked for Pinterest. I mean, he's a very brilliant man. And he said that he feels that it is, it is, you know, people with disability, as Neil was saying, and as Antonio was saying, they, um, they, they learn to try to accommodate themselves because they have no choice. But um, he feels that it is a, a design flaw that designers are not designing with all humans in mind. And so deciding that certain parts of humans, you, we're gonna design for them because it's easier and we know how to do it and our little policies and processes that we've created work for them, but not designing for our extreme users, I think is a loss, not only to those people that aren't included, but it also, it is a loss, I think, of opportunity, of creativeness, of innovation um, and true inclusion. So I, uh, you know what, and I know your work is trying to help and our work is trying to help break down these barriers, but I would have to say to designers, why are you not designing for all humans? Um, and why are you deciding that um, some human beings don't deserve to be designed for? And, and I understand a lot of designers would come back and say, well, we're doing it the way we were taught to do it. Yeah, but at some point, if you wanted to be a designer, I think you have to want to make sure that you're designing for all humans. So let me, I have a feeling you're gonna like that question, so go. 
I was going to say. Um, you know, it's amazing to me whether I'm, uh, and this is part of the reason why I'm trying to get into schools. And if I can in the very first semester, you know, and if I can in the very first couple of weeks, uh, because when I talk to, um, one of the ways that I connected with the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, uh, also known as the REIC, uh, which is sort of like the American Institute for Architects um, or the AIA, um, was that they held a conference and they let me come in and do my accessibility boot camp. And the thing with these conferences is all the most senior people go, right? <laughs> and so these are people who've been doing architecture for 30, 40 years or so. Um, and the look of shock on their face when I started talking about a lifetime of changing needs and abilities, and I'm going to show you the graphic that uh, um, uh, on Tuesday, I'll show you the graphic that I used to do that with, and the look of, oh my God, <laughs> and that's overwhelming the response I get is, I never thought about it like that, you know? Um, there's so much, um, as we talked about earlier, bias, but there's also so much assumption about what a disability means. So. You asked me to tell the story. <laughs> so um, I have multiple disabilities, but I wasn't uh, diagnosed with my disabilities until the very last year of high school because I was very bright. So growing up, I was always in the advanced enriched programs. And in the 70s and 80s, um, it never occurred to somebody that I, I, as a bright person, could have a disability. So I couldn't spell anything. My spelling was always bad. Um, kind of like I would lose, I'd write a story and it was a brilliant story and I'd lose 50% because this is pre-computers. So I'd lose 50% of my mark because I couldn't spell something. Um, and I would sometimes have trouble with math. I would switch numbers in math, you know, and I'd be sort of doing really well. And then all of a sudden I kind of go sideways solving a problem and they'd be like, your process is perfect. Like, you know, but you know, something wrong with you. Um, and so it was always presented like you're not trying hard enough. And, uh, and actually what I was doing was I'd actually come up with some of my own accommodations and I kind of hid a lot of my disability. Uh, and it wasn't until the very last year of high school that it finally became aware or some teacher just put their foot down and said, we have to fix, solve this. There's something's wrong here. Um, and we discovered I have a form of dyslexia, uh, that I need to wear glasses and I have hearing loss. So yeah, I wasn't hearing everything that was happening in the classroom and I couldn't see everything that was happening on the board and I wasn't able to express myself or spell things so I could have great ideas. But in the 70s and 80s, you didn't have computers. So that is an accommodation that has allowed me now as an adult to teach at university, to become a professional, to present at conferences, to write articles. And that part of my disability can disappear. Although my staff has to help me with my social media posts <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so I think like um, the fundamental fact that it's not a part of education, like if, if you looked at manufacturing, if there was, uh, if we were creating a product that was fundamentally flawed in some way, so in this case, not designing for people, um, if we were to look at a manufacturing process that was creating a defective product, we would go back and figure out how to fix the manufacturing process redesign what was happening. That's not happening in education. So everybody who goes through education keeps coming out the other side with all the same flaws and biases and misunderstandings and lack of awareness of all of the amazing opportunities. So one of the ways I like to describe this, <laughs> just to make it more relatable, is that in Canada, when I was growing up, I did a lot of international travel, but most of the kids that I was with, growing up with, only ever went to Florida. So if you said, I'm going to the States, you meant you were going to Disneyland in Florida. <laughs> so um, my analogy is, what if you were trying to go to California? But if, if you said to you know, your travel planner, I wanna go to the States, um, and they just assumed that meant you were going to Disneyland. <laughs> or Disney World, sorry. So they booked everything like you were going there. And then if you got to the airport and, and then saw your flight was going to Florida and then said, well, no, actually, I, wa I wanted to go to Disneyland in California, like that's a whole different trip. And it doesn't necessarily cost more to do one versus the other. But if I decide at the airport, so for example, at the, the start of design, I didn't want to go to Florida, I wanted to go to California, that's an added cost. So you can see where people start to think, oh, accessibility is so expensive. 
<laughs> no, it's when did you start thinking about it? Or worse, you fly to Florida and then realize, oh no, I meant I want a Disneyland in California and then try to rebook your vacation. So yeah. I think the education part is key. Yeah. Uh, and and it's 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 not the cost of accessibility. It's the cost of failing to plan to deliver accessibility that that is often what is prohibitive. Because retrofitting is is expensive. You know, you you booking that flight at the last minute, changing your flights from from Florida to California, that's going to cost you a, um, a packet. So um, totally agree. I think it's a really nice analogy uh, and, and I also totally relate with the whole late diagnosis thing too um, so how do we inculcate this better into uh, into sort of architecture and design because because actually in in the UK it is taught um, but what's interesting is that it doesn't necessarily filter through into the housing stock. So we, uh, a, a few months back, had Anna Dixon on from uh, the Centre for Aging Better. And she mentioned several of the things that you just mentioned about housing where you can age in place, that's designed so that uh, you don't have to move and, and, and uh, you, you could design a building that is flexible enough to be converted to meet your needs as you go through life stage. How, how do we inculcate that into the, the learning and, and more importantly, into the mainstream? Because although people might learn it, they don't apply it. So the housing stock that gets built is for the most part small. It's uh, on multiple stories, uh, multiple levels um, with difficulty, you know, narrow corridors that you'll have difficulty getting through doors. Some of that, I'm sure, relates to cost because it's cheaper to build smaller. And you guys on the other side of the Atlantic have much more generous space in your buildings than, than we do here, generally because we like quaint um, for, uh, for that read small and cramped, but, um, but there are finish. certain things. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's, it's, how, how do we change that? Because I, I, I do think that, that, that there needs to be a change and some things have changed. So that you go to a new house now in the UK, the sockets will be at waist height. So all of the electric sockets will be at waist height. So that they've made that change, right? So you, you, they're not on the floor anymore. You don't you, you don't have to reach down to uh, you know you, you know they're not wheelchair inaccessible. They're at waist height. Now sometimes that drives me crazy because I've got wires hanging up my walls, but I understand why it's done. So um, so but do see, you, that's a design problem. Yeah. So somebody didn't think about what that meant. They just raised the plug. That's not yeah. good design either. And I think yeah. like to your point, there's a couple of things that I want to unpack there. Um, one, yes, discrimination costs less. The, the way we've been designing is discriminatory against the largest minority group that we have. And it's the one minority group we are almost all of us going to join. So it makes no sense. I mean, even if you could justify discriminating against the largest minority group. But if, imagine if you were to say, this housing discriminates against, you know, fill in the blank for any other minority group, and the people would lose their minds, right? Like if you had a racial minority, or if you had a religious group, if you had a particular ethnicity, like people would lose it if you said this, this type of housing is discriminatory. Uh, so it's been really important for me and, and it's been a really big change to really start using that word it's not a nice word i don't like to have to use it but when people say to me but that's not how we always do it or yes it might cost more um the way we've been doing it is wrong um and who wants to be associated with discrimination whose brand 
we are proud to discriminate against our largest minority group. Like who wants to say that? You know, and I think there's a, I, I keep trying to sell this to developers. There's an enormous opportunity to get ahead. This is a business opportunity to, to, to say, we're doing something innovative here. We're going to take care of you for your entire life, for your family's life, your loved ones, your coworkers. We're going to make sure you have a place to live in the neighborhoods that you love um, for as long as you possibly can, you know? Uh, in the states, they have started, I've seen some developers marketing it as generational housing. And Florida's got some amazing stuff that's been happening. Uh, in Winnipeg, or just outside Winnipeg, we have a Bridgewater community where half of the development was developed is all age in place and um, visitable and adaptable housing, no step entry, other types of features. And it's beautiful. And it was done so well by designers that that was the housing that sold out first in that development. So it's not that it has to look ugly, although people who haven't been trained well in it will assume it's going to be institutional and it's going to be horrible. Or like in your situation where they didn't think about raising it up to waist level just means lots of wires, which everybody's going to think is ugly. There are some costs associated with it. If you're going to put power to operators, if you're going to have assisted listening, there are some costs. But if that's the cost of doing business, right? If a wider door should be the typical size door, then the size door we're using right now is the wrong size, but cost less. Well, let's change the typical yeah. door. And then that becomes by volume, the less least expensive door to use. So yeah. I think there's a whole bunch of stuff about how people think about it, what examples they've seen, and then really challenging them. Sticking to what we've always been doing is not the way out of this, and it really is discrimination. So uh, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that um, there's a couple of things I want to tie in before we close, because we're coming to a close. Um, Already? I know, time flies when you're having fun. So um, the, the regulation is really important, because regulation done in the right way can start changing the way that industry behaves. And we've and, and, and we talked before about um, you were interested in sustainability. I've I have a personal hobby horse that I like to ride, which is tying the whole idea of sustainability and accessibility together. Um, and what you talked about was yes, it's cheap to do to discriminate. Actually, it's not, but but the cost is borne by someone else, so it's an externality. And this is why I keep uh, referring to inaccessibility as being like pollution because, yes, and that's because yeah because the 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 polluter's not paying at the moment so we need to shift the cost of that externality back onto the people that are causing the cost to society uh, and when we do that through regulation and do it in a fair manner then it will absolutely start changing the way that things get delivered and hopefully we'll do it in a way that is also um, pleasing on the eye and um, designed beautifully because it can be we can do beautiful inclusive design it's possible people so um, rant over um, just <laughs> to say that um, we need to thank uh, Microlink Barclays Access and MyClearText for keeping us on air keeping us accessible and um, look forward to you joining us on Twitter for the chat on Tuesday Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you so much again for having me. And, you know, have me back in six months and we'll talk, keep talking. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> Love having you as our, part of our community. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.